Good afternoon and welcome to part one of the ELEX webinar six-part series on working with continuing resources, advice and examples from the trenches, emerging trends and advancements for library resource discovery. I'm Allison Armstrong, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee and will be your host for this afternoon's webinar. Our presenter today is Marshall Breeding, an independent consultant. Areas of interest include ways that libraries can leverage the capability of tools beyond the confines of their own websites to increase discoverability of library resources in other contexts such as learning management systems, community portals, and the general web. I would also like to recognize Heather Staines representing CRS's Education, Research, and Publications Coordinating Committee. This is the committee that organized the webinar series at the request of the Continuing Education Committee by helping to select topics and find presenters. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive ch chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. However, we will not be monitoring the Twitter feed. If you have questions for Marshall, please type them into the question box on your screen and he will answer them as time permits at the end of this presentation. Any questions which remain unanswered while we're on the air will be answered offline and the answers will be sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. Please take time to fill out the evaluation form since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Marshall. So thanks for that introduction. Um, let me know if you can see my slides. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, speak with you today about uh, about discovery, uh, trying to touch uh, on various kind of aspects of that that are especially of interest to uh, technical services and collection development, uh, even though these are patron-facing tools. Uh, so uh, here's the description that was in the program. Um, a lot of the uh, content and resources for this talk and a lot of the others that I do come from my Library Technology Guides website. Uh, LibraryTechnology.org is where you can go to see that and, you know, it, it has a kind of wide variety of resources related to library technologies, kind of both in resource management systems, discovery systems, and, and others, you know, companies and products and all that kind of information. Uh, by the way, you can get a copy of the slides that I'm using today from the website. If you just go to the website and look for the document repository, select by presentations, it should be the top one. So it should be fairly easy to find that and other material that might be of interest. Uh, another project I do every year is the industry report. Uh, has been previously published by Library Journal and recent years published American Libraries. Uh, currently working on the next issue of that for 2015. Uh, so a lot of the data that I use in my presentations is originally published in one of these reports. Uh, so take a look at that and you'll find out you know, a lot of kind of statistics and information and narrative about the different products and companies in the industry. Uh, as I said, published in American libraries. Uh, includes data tables of kind of uh, how many of these are uh, sold, uh, implemented by libraries year by year. I want to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, of more particular interest, uh, today's conversation, uh, this is a table that's actually in development with data that will appear in the next industry report, uh, the, showing the different kinds of discovery products that are kind of offered, used in North America and Europe, uh, 
of different kinds. Uh, the ones that we'll talk most about, as we'll get to in the presentation, are what I call index-based discovery systems. Uh, those are the ones that you see highlighted kind of in brown, uh, EBSCO Discovery Service, Primo and Primo Central from Ex Libris, and Summon from ProQuest. And you can see in the right-hand column the kind of the numbers of installations of those. Um, uh, EBSCO Discovery Service is implemented very widely, lots of different kinds of libraries. Uh, this year they're reporting over 8,000. Um, 1,500 for Primo, uh, almost 700 for Summon. Um, OCLC's Royal Cat Discovery Service, I don't include on this table, kind of have a harder time monitoring the numbers for that one. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of uh, kind of patron catalog interfaces, discovery interfaces for, for libraries, and kind of its current state. Uh, when you look at the current state of uh, a library's website, so, some, some are better than others, of course, uh, you know, there's just so many different things that are offered in, in, a, in a library website, including online catalogs, uh, a search box for the website, uh, different finding aids for uh, getting to articles, lists of uh, e-journals, uh, you know, Web guide, web guides, and you know all these other kinds of things, uh, and it can be quite a challenge for patrons to have to uh, manage dealing with all of those in, in separate kinds of ways. Uh, so I think part of what we want to accomplish is to bring more things together where it makes sense to, well. I'm sorry, it sounds like we've got um, technical difficulties. Um, I don't know, if, Marshall, if you can try to get your sound back. Test, is it back now? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, moving right along, I'm not quite sure why it dropped out, but I had to kind of go through the process to reestablish the audio drivers. So the, the online catalog uh, is something that we're used to, but it provides access to only a fairly narrow set of uh, library resources uh, compared to the overall collections that libraries have. Uh, when you think that academic libraries especially have you know, very large article level collections that they want to provide access to uh, the integrated library system, the online catalog, isn't the right tool for getting access to that. So there, there are really a lot of things that are out of scope in, in that. You know, uh, book chapters, you know, sometimes there are analytics that help with that, but digital objects, website content, uh, you know, lots and lots of things that libraries consider part of their collections that you're just not going to find through the traditional online catalog. So, you know, there's been a lot of effort to try to uh, increase the scale of what patrons are able to find when they type into the search box that the library provides. Uh, go from, you know, the, just the local resources to those that are included in the uh, subscriptions of the library and at the article level. So that's a pretty ambitious thing to do. Um, you gain a, a lot in content, you lose some in kind of precision and, and sophistication sometimes, 
so you hope that you can come up with the right compromise between broadness of scope and the kind of searching and predictability that libraries want to offer as they provide access to their collections. So here is an illustration of what I would call the current model of index-based discovery. Um, and you know, it's an ambitious one, uh, and there are a limited number of products out there that do that. Uh, so they're, they're index-based. So the idea is having a very kind of large-scale, massive index of content at the most granular level possible with metadata and content index to provide the broadest number of access points in, into those collection items. Uh, keep in mind that you know this is at the article level across all of the things that not only the library subscribes to, but that are actually in the body of scholarly content, uh, scholarly publishing. So these indexes uh, contain the potential content that a library would subscribe to, which then can be scoped by what that library actually subscribes to, uh, so that each so that, you know this index is used by all libraries, and then every library using it can profile it according to their own subscriptions. So you can see that a wide variety of materials uh, end up in these indexes. Uh, harvested from the the local repositories uh, would be things like the you know um, mark records, holdings, and all of that from the integrated library system, uh, local digital collections, uh, repositories of you know, institutional repositories, ETDs, all those kinds of things, uh, and then kind of the globally available content from uh, commercial publishers, from open access sites, uh, from things like Hathi Trust, uh, reference resources, you know, a variety of of items of content that potentially want to be within this universe of search. Uh, and as I said, the library would then, as they subscribe to one of these, uh, program in the things they subscribe to so that you can at least have an initial search that includes things that library that the patrons can click on and view right away because the library subscribes to it. But they may also have a way to look beyond the subscriptions of the library uh, to learn about other things that they might have to get upon request. Uh, these systems can also uh, take advantage of kind of login information. If a patron logs in, it knows that they're in a certain discipline. It might be able to favor relevance rankings and those kinds of things in order to be able to show that material kind of first and better. <clears throat> uh, works, you know, there are products in the, in the public library space that have maybe less of an emphasis on this index level scholarly content, uh, but maybe more of an emphasis in community information and, and those kind of resources that are of interest to libraries. <clears throat> Different ways to assemble a discovery environment. Uh, another example I want to show you is what's often called the bento box, where it may rely on one of these discovery indexes. Uh, uh, subscribe to the index, but not necessarily use its own interface, but use something like Blacklight or ViewFind or you know one of the other <coughs> discovery interfaces, maybe Innovative, Innovative's Encore, uh, to be able to then present search results from a variety of different sources. The local catalog maybe is a separate uh, panel in the bento box. Website content, institutional repositories are some of the ones that I uh, show as being possibly separate panels in discovery. But you know, once you have this level of control, you can design the you know, presentation of search results in whichever way that, that you want. And it's just a matter of uh, you know, more than preference, but uh, user experience design and so forth to determine whether it makes sense to have kind of all search results integrated as they're returned uh, to users in kind of the, the standard delivery of these index-based discovery systems or in a segmented approach as you would see uh, in the bento box model. What I hope we're working toward is a more cohesive and comprehensive presentation of library content and services to be presented in a coherent way uh, to 
the community users of the library and all the different devices that they might have. Uh, the slide illustrates uh, the common reality today that our users are using kind of uh, laptop and desktops less and increasingly more they're relying on some smartphones, tablets, and other mobile devices. So again, an environment that kind of organically puts things together in a unified way as opposed to a lot of different handoffs uh, from patrons from one system to another to another, all provided by a library, but all looking and feeling different. So going back for a minute to the index-based discovery services, you know, there are different ones out there. Libraries have to make decisions about whether they want one at all, and if they do, uh, how it provides access to their collection. Uh, so it's important to have a pretty good understanding about how, you know, what they cover, what they don't cover, how they do relevancy, kind of all these different uh, features that would lead a library toward one discovery service and another. Uh, you know, basically, you know, you want to make sure that the uh, materials to which your library subscribes are well represented in whatever discovery environment you provide, because if they're not, then you don't get the value of their subscriptions. It's like they're invisible and they don't get used, and uh, that doesn't help the, the library relative to its investment in those content items. It doesn't help the publisher because you're not likely to renew if they're not getting use. Uh, so kind of the alignment between the coverage uh, of your subscriptions and the exposure and the discovery interface is, is you know, a really crucial uh, uh, decision point. So that when you think of the construction of these discovery services, you know, it is an ecosystem that crosses into various stakeholder groups, the publishers of the you know, the original materials, uh, e-journals, and, and those kind of uh, primary publishers, uh, databases and abstracting and index producers that aggregate a lot of content, uh, the libraries that acquire these products, both the content products and the discovery services, uh, the discovery service providers that are building these systems, and then of course the, the users of the library, I guess, who would probably consider the, the key stakeholder. Um, but how well these discovery services work, you know, is uh, is just critical for all of those different stakeholders. Uh, if they don't perform well, the library customers aren't happy, which makes librarians unhappy. If certain resources are, are not exposed well, then the publishers of those uh, resources will not be uh, you know, happy about the way that discovery service works and may be less likely to cooperate with it even more in the future uh, and so forth. So it's just really important that there be kind of uh, good attention to all the different layers and, and levels that are involved in, you know, this discovery ecosystem so that all these stakeholders end up with their, their needs met. Um, this slide, if you can see it, uh, represents some of the top things that I think libraries worry about. That you know, it's it's all about you know, kind of uh, getting good use out of the investments made in subscriptions. You know, a typical academic library may invest uh, 70, 80, 90 percent of its collection budget uh, in access to electronic resources. So when those do not get used. Uh, you know, or the use is uneven relative to the way that they perform a discovery service, then, you know, that's really a critical problem for a library. Uh, it's important, uh, you know, these discovery systems are not inexpensive, so you want to make sure you're getting your money's worth out of them, that they are uh, performing in the way that you expected them to, uh, and that all of the resources that you subscribe to or that you want to provide access to through open access and local repositories are also kind of very well represented. So it's important to be able to evaluate that. Uh, things get complicated uh, in some aspects of things because some of the discovery service providers are also content providers. Uh, the key examples of that are EBSCO and, and ProQuest. So they both provide discovery services. They, they both have content services. So there's you know uh, strong interest in making sure that those content products 
are well exposed in discovery services, uh, even by competing providers. Uh, there are some that have back-end resource management systems like OCLC and Ex Libris that also provide discovery services. So you want to make sure that there's good interoperability uh, when you want to use one discovery service uh, and a different kind of back-end solution. So lots of kind of levels of complexity and tension. Uh, you want to make sure that as different players uh, have different roles in this ecosystem that they continue to work toward the the library's advantage. Uh, you know, these indexes uh, of the index-based discovery services are massive. Uh, you want to make sure that you know they actually work and perform well and deliver results in kind of good relevancy order that will not only allow patrons to kind of be satisfied with having gotten something, but that librarians will also uh, be able to say, yeah, I think they've got pretty much the right things. Uh, that's a much higher threshold of uh, difficulty uh, to, to keep the librarian satisfied with the performance of these systems than the patrons who don't necessarily know uh, what they should have gotten. Uh, one of the key issues now is kind of how uh, ANI content shows up in discovery services. Uh, this is the point, this is the area where uh, the participation of the providers is more uneven uh, than with the primary publishers. Uh, but whether it's primary or secondary, it's important to know what's indexed and how current it is. And that it's really hard to do this because the content can be represented in uneven kinds of ways, where there may be full text for some items and citations for others. Uh, so how do you uh, generate good relevancy uh, when there's not the same level of data and metadata in the index in order to be able to surface the right materials according to any given query. Uh, you know, mark records for uh, books are very kind of lightweight metadata compared to the metadata available for uh, scholarly articles, for example. Um, so you, you want to make sure that your collection is well covered. I think this slide kind of repeats some things that that I said already. Uh, when I think about the current state of these discovery indexes, I'm you know, generally pretty favorable uh, and optimistic that they're getting better. Uh, I think they do an excellent job of covering kind of the primary body of scholarly content that's in English and European languages, uh, where they start to get weaker are in kind of uh, not non-Roman script languages, uh, Asian languages, Arabic, and so forth. Uh, you know, it provide. You know, there there are fewer resources that in those languages that are indexed, and even when they are, the the searching can be very challenging, uh, especially if the metadata is in the same same language. Uh, so, how do you do kind of multilingual uh, searching in order to be able to get uh, non-English materials in response to a query given in English, uh, and vice versa? Uh, I mentioned earlier that this is a key area of concern for publishers. Uh, they want to make sure that their content is uh, well exposed and that uh, it's never disadvantaged by having somebody and another publisher's content preferred in, in different kind of uh, linking arrangements. How I and I materials show up is, is kind of complicated and, re and uh, reflected in complicated ways. Uh, you know, when it doesn't, uh, when an ANI provider doesn't participate in an index, the discovery service provider will often go and index the full text of the journals covered and kind of describe how it does that in complicated and confusing kinds of ways. Again, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, what's more interesting, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of relevancy sorting according to keyword algorithms and uh, that kind of uh, factor. But, you know, when there's so many result candidates in response to especially a broad query, uh, you want to use as many social factors as you can. Uh, kind of how much any given uh, piece of content is, is cited, used, linked to, uh, and so forth are very important 
clues and being able to come up with relevancy rankings. And the more that you know about users, the more you're able to target uh, you know, the right kind of results in response to their query, uh, given all the different meanings of keywords and different kinds of uh, levels of resources and disciplines of resources that you can do a better job of targeting once you know that it's a student as opposed to a faculty member and a philosopher as opposed to a chemist and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so for a little bit more information uh, on kind of the general realm of Discovery Services. I did an issue of Library Technology Reports. I think it's about an 80-page uh, report uh, that was published by uh, ALA TechSource uh, in their Library Technology Reports series, and you know it gives uh, you know a lot more detail than I've been able to cover today about kind of the genre of index-based discovery services and the particular products involved. Uh, Another thing I want to point out is the Open Discovery Initiative. You know, a lot of these potential problems related to index-based discovery, uh, you know, are you know, you know, are subject to being improved through better cooperation and and uh, and and you know, better practices established in the way that the discovery services are built, their cooperation with publishers, uh, and so forth. So the Open Discovery Initiative was a group that still is a group uh, <clears throat> uh, that was formed in order to be able to uh, make recommended practices and establish a better level of transparency in the way that discovery indexes are, are constructed and, and populated and described by their providers. The, representing three of the stakeholder groups, libraries, publishers, and, and service providers. Uh, this group worked for almost two years to be able to uh, work toward the publication of a recommended practice that addressed you know, several aspects of, of this issue. Uh, everything from you know, how content providers uh, deliver uh, data metadata to the discovery service providers, uh, providing statistics back to publishers about how resources are being used and to libraries uh, to ensure fair linking um, to content uh, through the discovery service and for libraries to know what's indexed and at what level. So that work I'm sorry, um, Marshall. It looks like we've we've lost sound again. I'm not sure. Okay, back again. Sorry about that. Yes. At least I know how to recover from it. Um, so uh, there's now a standing committee for the Open Discovery Initiative, um, and um, you know that that work that group is working on kind of publicizing. Uh, and organizing conformance to the recommended practice. Uh, I'm not a chair of that group, but a member of that group, so I'm very happy that that group is kind of doing the maintenance work related to the uh, Open Discovery Initiative. You can see the, the, the current roster of participants uh, on this slide, if you can see it. And related matter, I've been commissioned by NISO to uh, produce a white paper on discovery, some of kind of the, the next steps uh, that are happening in, in discovery that could happen, uh, areas where an ISO might want to be involved more in the future. Uh, so that uh, paper will actually be published tomorrow, right? tomorrow or Friday, I think. So it's getting pretty close to being available. Uh, here's a basic outline, if you can see it, of uh, what 
the general sections of the paper covered, uh, beginning with kind of the, the obligatory general background and discovery services. Um, I talk quite a bit about uh, thoughts regarding the integration between discovery systems and resource management systems. Should they be uh, paired together or offered separately? Uh, linked data is certainly a big topic. Uh, what features are not in these systems that libraries are disappointed by? And what are some uh, opportunities to enhance these uh, in ways that will help them be more effective? Uh, and then, you know, how do you you know, the big topic, which I hope to mention a little bit later in this conversation as well, is, you know, the, the reality that a lot of discovery happens beyond the library, and so how do we improve discoverability? So, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a topic of interest uh, for the very long term. You know, it's crucial to libraries uh, to kind of keep up with making you know, all of the kind of possibilities and opportunities that are available to make their collections available to their users. Uh, a lot of it has to do, you know, with the topic of, of interest uh, here is, you know, how do you uh, manage metadata in ways that will enhance discovery and not in a lot of the ways that we've been used to, such as through online catalogs, but in discovery services and in the, and, and the open web. So I think that is a uh, key topic. Uh, of kind of the changes in metadata management to favor discoverability in broad terms instead of specific systems. Uh, RDA is something that was a baby step along the way uh, to kind of more web-friendly exposure of metadata. BibFrame, I think, is a bigger step as we think about mapping uh, library-oriented bibliographic data into uh, a model of linked data that will offer, I think, some pretty transformational opportunities uh, in the way that library resources uh, are exposed outside of our integrated library systems and exposed on the broader web for discovery by those who don't uh, think to kind of come to the interfaces the library provides. Uh, it may mean thinking uh, different ways about how metadata are managed in libraries uh, as these new uh, structures and standards uh, come online into systems. You know, just the message is that things will probably change. Uh, that the idea of an online catalog is already uh, to uh, think beyond the kind of the the online catalog that's provided with integrated library systems to new generations of resource management systems uh, that don't necessarily include the same kind of concept of online catalog, but rather assume one of these broad-based discovery services, uh, but without losing anything uh, in the process. Uh, linked data is kind of the big thing when it comes to next generation exposure of resources on the web. Uh, so, you know, that is uh, clearly an area of development that we all have to pay attention to. I expect there to be an interim period uh, where we're still dealing mostly with kind of record oriented metadata schemes like MARC, but are also uh, using linked data, open linked data, uh, as we have opportunities to do that, uh, you know, kind of expanding on that instead of a total replacement. Uh, but the idea being that, you know, how do you construct resources uh, and resource descriptions in ways that will uh, allow them to be discovered even when they don't go through uh, library systems per se. Um, so, there are a lot of kind of technologies and techniques that are available to do that, and I'll try to mention uh, just a, a couple of them. Uh, the idea being that, so if a, if a researcher is starting on Google or Google Scholar, uh, you know, Microsoft Academic Search or some of these non-library uh, resources, our library resources constructed in a way that can be harvested by those kinds of indexed indexes so that users will find them uh, even when they're not using library provided resources. Uh, so there are ways to structure uh, the delivery of those resources. Uh, 
a lot of which are under the control of the library, um, you know, through their websites and and another kind and uh, online like catalog discovery systems, uh, repositories, uh, so that they're more cleanly and efficiently harvested by those kinds of, of resources. Uh, when it comes to published scholarly resources, you know, that's a little bit out of library control, but you know that those publishers are also engaging in more and more of the same kind of technique so that their resources are, are well exposed. So just to mention a, a few kind of practical things that libraries need to think about as they build any kind of web page, resource page, or kind of anything like that, uh, that provides a presentation of a resource on the web. We often think of uh, building these pages in a way uh, that they look nice to humans and are well organized, but it's also got to be done in ways that will uh, optimize uh, their semantic structure so that you know, other kinds of uh, harvesting bots and search engines uh, will be able to recognize that content and then therefore uh, index it well and drive users back to that content. Um, so you know, a lot of it are techniques that have been used on the web on the commercial side for a long time uh, to what we call search engine optimization and I'm sure that you're familiar with that and there are some specific techniques you can use uh, in that vein that are pretty, pretty well established um, and a little bit more recent concern I think especially uh, in the library arena are the semantic enhancements that you can do to uh, go beyond content presentation to be able to add semantic structure. Uh, one of the mechanisms that's been talked about a lot uh, is schema.org, uh, and I'll show you an example of that uh, right in a minute. So I know that this the print of this is kind of small, but you know it's showing you know just the basic kinds of things that uh, a web page that describes any resource. Uh, needs to be needs to be there in order so that the search engines will be able to index it better. Uh, there has been kind of movement away from uh, Dublin Core as a preferred way to describe uh, content resources uh, to kind of more precise ways uh, that uh, establish uh, details regarding citations. So this is just one example of that. Uh, you know, for a while, uh, search engines didn't care about this metadata because you could kind of game the system. But in recent years, as long as the metadata is consistent with the page content, uh, then they will use that information, and it's very helpful in the in the way that it's uh, indexed. Uh, but looking back at the actual body of the page is where you can start to add this semantic structure that goes beyond kind of the visual presentation of resources in a page to uh, semantic presentation. Uh, so the example you see is, uh, you know, you can have a heading that kind of gives the text of a article title or a chapter title, but then you can also uh, use references to schema to say that yes, this is an article and that this is the title of the article so that it's perfectly clear amongst all the other HTML coding in a page that yeah, this is its title and then it can be indexed accordingly and you can do that with almost any component of an article or a resource, uh, whether it be in a Scarlet article or the library's own website. So the other an example I want to show is you know similar to what you would do for for like the library website. So here is a just a library listing from my uh, libraries.org library directory that I maintain, and you can see that the HTML is built in for a certain kind of visual presentation, but also within all of the HTML are the schema.org structures so that you know, the, the data of that page, the organization of the page uh, are then understandable. 
So I took this same page and I put it into a tool called Google Rich Snippets, uh, which has all the parsers in order to be able to detect uh, and reproduce the structure that it sees. Uh, so you can see the URL of the Rich Snippets uh, resource and then its interpretation of this page. Uh, it knows the name of the library, what hours it's open, uh, so that it could kind of build resources that say, yeah, this library is open now. Uh, here's its phone number, here's its address, URL, a description. Uh, I'll break it up into a few pages. Uh, again, here's its address, its post office box, you know, all these kinds of things that are not represented just as text, but as structured data. Uh, and again, including the geographic coordinates of it so that other resources could say, here's this library and this is where it would show up on a map. So more and more that you're able to incorporate that kind of structural metadata in any resource, uh, the more useful it becomes on the web. I'm taking my time. Um, so, you know, as those, in, you know, using expertise in, from, you know, uh, cataloging and, and metadata management, you know, these are exactly the skills uh, that are very helpful in applying kind of new ways of adding structured metadata uh, to resources and pages uh, that previously haven't been dealt with in that way, but that can benefit uh, the library as well. Um, so I guess I want to mention a little bit about kind of the openness of discovery systems and open access content. How does that fit in? Uh, you know, uh, why aren't there kind of open uh, access versions of these discovery interfaces instead of just the commercial ones? Um, and, you know, that's a question I actually address in the white paper. And it really has to do with kind of, you know, the high numbers of resources that are involved in doing that. Uh, but the more that we work toward uh, open access uh, content, the more that we can be exposed as open link data uh, to kind of lower the threshold of producing discovery systems uh, that are above and beyond just a, a small number of large commercial systems. Um, so another topic of interest has to do with the connection between the resource management systems and the discovery services. Um, question often comes up, can we mix and match? Can we have to get the one provided by the same vendor? Uh, and, you know, I guess it, you know, the, the state of the art is kind of in, uh, in play there. Or there are some uh, where they are offered as match sets and it's kind of hard to separate them. Uh, like with Alma and Primo, uh, World Share Management Services and World uh, Cat Discovery Services, you know, they're pretty closely tied. It's theoretically possible to separate them, uh, but it kind of takes quite a bit of work. And then if you're working with the open source Qualia Lay, then it doesn't come with a discovery component, uh, so you would have to provide your own. Uh, but the general question is, you know, should these linkages be strong or weak? Um, so uh, I guess that <laughs> brings me kind of to the end of my prepared remarks. Uh, I think we have um, at least 10 minutes or so to be able to uh, respond to questions. So I'm happy to do that at this point. I'm happy. So do we have any questions pending? I'm not seeing very much in the question box at this point. It looks like we have a question about WorldCat discovery. Um, okay. So what is WorldCat discovery service, uh, I guess, is one of the questions. And when I'm working on this one, please add in other questions. I know that there are probably some other things that I didn't cover as clearly or that I didn't address that, that we have time to talk about. So, you know, from the from OCLC, you know, the, the global nonprofit organization uh, that we've been working with for many, many years as primarily a cataloging bibliographic service, uh, as you probably know, has been involved. Marshall, I think we've lost sound again.
thanks for letting me know. I don't know why it keeps dropping out. Um, but so uh, OCLC uh, has developed WorldShare Management Platform as a kind of ILS replacement so that you can leverage the WorldCat database and holdings uh, by adding items and then it has a new platform to be able to perform acquisitions and circulation and, and all of the other functions traditionally carried out in an integrated library system. Uh, so in addition to that, uh, they've also uh, revamped their discovery products. Uh, you know, WorldCat.org is the general internet-based interface for access to the WorldCat database and, and other materials. WorldCat Local uh, has been around a long time as a product that uh, provides access to WorldCat but also has uh, connections to a library's local integrated library system. Uh, WorldCat Discovery Service is the product that is now being developed and uh, being phased in uh, as the new generation of both WorldCat Local and the First Search Service. Uh, so First Search is also kind of a uh, article-oriented, uh, might call it database product that OCLC has supported for a number of years, uh, but it's getting out of date. Uh, as far as its interface and, and a lot of the expectations for the content it manages. So OCLC has kind of modernized its approach to be more of a full index-based discovery service. Uh, Work at Local had, had that as well, um, but to deliver it through a new platform that will kind of also replace uh, for search. So it is going to be the the default offering for libraries that use uh, WorldShare management services um, and it will be a standalone product as well for libraries that, that want to be able to uh, have a discovery service uh, you know, that goes above and beyond the former first search service. Okay. Hope that answers that question. Looking for other questions. Such a, such a quiet group. Uh, somebody asked what ODI and NISO stand for, uh, Open Discovery Initiative, uh, I think showed up later on the slides after uh, the question was asked, and NISO is the National Information Standards Organization, it is the national and international body that sets recommended practices and standards related to libraries and the kind of information industry uh, in the U.S. How does BibFrame fit within all the discovery products? Would BibFrame be separate if vendors do not incorporate into their products? Well, so you need to think of the support of BibFrame in the same way that MARC has been supported in both resource management systems and resource discovery systems. Uh, you know, MARC communications format has been uh, the way of uh, expressing bibliographic information about library collections for this very long period of time. It was a structure that was designed essentially for mainframe computers when network bandwidth and storage were uh, very scarce. Uh, but as the world has changed to XML and more recently open linked data, you know, the library uh, realm has been interested in you know, kind of remapping bibliographic data to a new carrier, uh, so targeting uh, RDF, Resource Description Framework, and XML instead of MARC Communications format as the underlying structure for bibliographic information. So what that means is that whether it's a discovery system or a management system, they need to be able to understand bibliographic information that is encoded in that way. Um, and it's actually a uh, more versatile approach than MARC has been, uh, even though MARC is uh, much, much more widely implemented. Uh, so the transition is going to be uh, quite difficult. Uh, one in that you know there's this uh, you know billions of MARC records in the field that 
will it need to be remapped into bib frame at some point but but more to the question uh, systems will have to be engineered in order to be able to understand metadata uh, when it's presented in bib frame uh, instead of in addition to mark 21 formats that transition will be made i think by uh, as it's kind of happening anyway, by taking a more abstract approach to metadata management. Most of the new systems do not have MARC kind of hardwired into them, like some of the systems of the past did, but are rather uh, more abstract tools for dealing with metadata that comes in different kinds of forms. You know, MARC 21, uh, uh, Dublin Core, VRA, BebFrame, and so forth. So. I think the idea is uh, to try to be more flexible uh, with metadata management and not hard coded into any one thing, which then opens up the door for being able to manage metadata and discover metadata in new and emerging formats such as BibRAM. Okay, um, are BibFrame and Schema mutually exclusive? No, no, they, they work well together. Um, you know, uh, you would be able to um, have resources that are uh, expressed in BibFrame that also in include the schema.org elements either at the same time or through different versions of the presentation of them. Uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're they're pretty consistent, I think. They're, you know, they, uh, you know, they're they're both based on kind of XML and uh, namespaces and and you know a lot of similar concepts. Okay, looking at Harriet's question. Should the new standards improve cooperation? I'm having a hard time reading the question. Uh, between EBSCO, ProQuest, and so forth. Um, so I'm not sure that that helps. Uh, you know, sure, having different and, and different standards and lower thresholds of difficulty uh, are all for the good, but it still doesn't get at kind of the business and cooperative issues about when any given content provider uh, chooses to expose its metadata to other kinds of resources. And I think that's from the impasse that we have now is that, you know, ProQuest offer and EBSCO both uh, manage a lot of different kinds of resources and have different arrangements to different kinds of service providers such as discovery services about when they will provide that metadata, uh, when the current controversies is um, whether EBSCO will provide access to its subject indexes to other discovery services. So, you know, it's not a technical problem, it's not a standards problem, you know, it is a uh, issue of business and cooperation that I'm optimistic will get resolved. Is ETS integration into another discovery layer worthwhile? Does this mean that libraries are already incorporating? Okay, this is a separate question, I think. Uh, sure, I think that um, is EDS integration to another discovery layer worthwhile? Uh, so uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, is EDS integration to other discovery layers worthwhile? Uh, so I would say that it is a uh, common practice in a way that if you have a discovery layer uh, such as Encore from Innovative, Viewfind, Blacklight, uh, Enterprise, so the basic discovery interfaces from either the open source uh, programs or uh, those provided by other vendors, then you can license and integrate uh, EBSCO Discovery Service and provide access to that interface. So EBSCO has lots of arrangements with all of those uh, vendors in order to be able to do that. Um, but if you're saying, well, the EDS index become part of the index of 
other index-based discovery services such as those from uh, OCLC, Ex Libris, and ProQuest, and that's kind of a different question. It has to do with will metadata be transferred uh, to be populated into those indexes, and that gets into that question that I was talking about just a minute ago. Okay, and let's see what we're doing on time. We have time for maybe one more question. And so, as I read it here, sorry for being slow. So does this mean that libraries that are already incorporating linked data with open source may not necessarily be moving to BibFrame? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are already incorporating linked data with open source may not necessarily be moving to BibFrame. Um, I think those are different. You know, BibFrame uh, has a lot, um, you know, is moving toward being the standard way of cataloging resources. Uh, so in the same way that you would say, well, do records that we obtain through sources like Library of Congress and OCLC, well, now we're used to them being in Mark 21 format. Uh, and then is it AACR2 or RDA? So I guess in the next phase it will be that you know the the records uh, that we produce in our local systems uh, will need to interoperate with sources that are delivering BibFrame records instead of uh, those previous uh, carriers. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of an apples to oranges question that. Uh, how you're dealing with uh, open source and open access uh, is somewhat in a different line. Marsha, we've lost you again. Okay, so I'm back again. So. I'm not sure how much of my response to the last question came through, uh, but I, but I think that I've tried to to respond to at least most of the questions that I was able to see uh, in the panel. So, are, are there other questions that? Okay, and if not, I think I'm happy to turn the presentation back over to our hosts, Allison. Thank you. So first, I want to thank you for bearing with us through some audio issues. And I want to thank Marshall for his presentation and want to thank you all for attending this webinar. I want to thank Iping Shen Kathy for providing technical support and recording it. And I would like to add that this is the very beginning of a six-part series. We hope you'll be interested in the other parts as well. On February 23rd, part two is tailoring communications to different audiences. Part three is on March 9th, workflow maps, tools for insight and enhancement. March 11th is part four, persistence, got yours, preserving scholarship. Part five on March 16th, ebook cataloging using the shared mailbox. And on March 18th, we have part six, cataloging continuing resources and a changing landscape. We hope you'll look for future ELEX programs on the website on the screen. And please fill out the evaluation when you receive it to help us develop more programs that you're interested in. Thank you for coming.